This week's Pasha is Pasha Chukat, and I'd like to discuss the famous question, why do bad things happen to good people? This is not meant to be a definitive response or a final response, but at least I'd like to explore this topic a little bit. And as an introduction, it's worthwhile uh, recognizing that often we will translate a certain word uh, in English into Hebrew and just think that that's the end of the story. Uh, or we'll just translate a concept into a word in Hebrew, and again, we'll think that that's the end of the story. But the way the Torah, the Chumash, uses that word will often really inform us and deepen our understanding of that concept. For example, if, we, if I was to ask, what's the word in Hebrew for acts of loving kindness or loving kindness, we would say, right? That's in the second version of Yerkeavot. On three things, the world stands. On Torah, on Avoda, and on Avoda, and on on acts of loving kindness. Now, if we were to discuss, okay, well, what does an act of loving kindness look like? We would say, it's an act of giving. And that is where we need to look at the Chumash, because very interestingly, if we are to look into Parashat Vayera, and we're going to revisit Vayera, we're in the fifth Aliyah, we're in chapter 21, verse 8. Here's what it says in Parashat Bereshit, right, the very first Chumash. It says, we're talking about Yitzchak. Vayigdala yeled, vayigamal. Vayas Avraham yishtegadol, bayom higamel at Yitzchak. So we see the word gamal twice. What does it mean? The child grew and was weaned. Abraham made a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. Now, weaning means that you stop nursing the child. That's very interesting. Apparently, what ligmol means, ligmol chesed, to do an act of loving kindness, is to stop giving to the child. It means to stop nursing the child. And that, again, it deepens our concept of what chesed looks like. Because if we were to ask, what does an act of chesed look like? We'd say an act of giving. But the Torah is highlighting that often, or Really, kindness is truly actualized once there's an act of giving, but eventually that giving is stopped, it's cut off, because that makes the giving real. For example, when God allows the rains to shower, if the rains never stopped, there would be a flood. That is a curse. That would destroy all of the crops. Really, the, the blessing of the rain comes when it finally stops. The rain has to come, but it also has to stop. And the giving is truly actualized once the, once the rain stops, because that's what allows the fields to grow after that. So too with the child, you need to give to the child, give the child what, what, the, what the child needs, but then eventually you need to stop, the ch uh, stop giving because otherwise the child will be spoiled. That is at least the very basic idea of gmilut chesed, the true definition or at least a deeper definition of gmilut chasadim, acts of loving kindness. So why do we mention all of this as an introduction? That's because there's another word that we will translate into something else in Hebrew. For example, the word miracle. Now, in Parshat Chukat, there are a number of miracles that happen, namely the main Meriva, right? God strikes the rock, and the water pours forth. In fact, he th strikes it twice, but the point is the water pours forth. That was a miracle. How do we say miracle in Hebrew? A nace. Nace. Very interestingly, that word is used in our parasha. Now, I'm going to read these psukim in English, and then read it in Hebrew, and I'm doing this on purpose so we can see the difference. So, just as a, by way of prelude, the Jewish people were complaining again, and God sent fiery serpents against them, and many people were dying, so Moshe prayed uh, to God. And here's what God says. Hashem said to Moses, we're in chapter 21, verse 8. This is in our parasha, so in Pamidbar. Ch chapter 21, verse 8. Hashem said to Moses, make for yourself a fiery serpent and place it on a pole, and it will be that anyone who is bitten will look at it and live. Moses made a serpent of copper and placed it on the pole, so it was that if the serpent bit a man, he would share the copper serpent and live. Here's what it says in Hebrew. Amazingly, the translation for nace here that Moshe put it on a nace, it can't possibly be, in, be, be a miracle. Moshe is putting something on a miracle, that doesn't make sense. So what does nace mean? Nace means a pole. It's a banner. Now, just at the very basic level, that's because when God performs miracles in this world, it's because he's raising his banner. He's attracting our attention. We now notice that the rules of nature have been broken. So we'll notice God. That's God's banner. But there's something else going on. Nace also is used in a different context. It's used for an asylum, for a trial, a difficulty. For example, 
the ten Nisyonot of Avraham Avinu. And in fact, if we go back to Parshat Vayera, the same Parshat that I spoke about Vayigamal, then we see at the very end it talks about Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac. And how does that episode begin? We're in chapter 22, verse 1, or the seventh Aliyah in Parshat Vayera, again back to Bereshit. Vayhi acharat varim ha'ele, vavohim nisa et Avraham, vayomer elav Avraham, vayomer hineni. And it happened after these things that God tested Avraham and said to him, Avraham, and he replied, here I am. Nisa, from the word nes. Now the reason why those two things are connected, and nes and nisa, a miracle, and a trial, or a banner, a pole, and a trial, is as follows. Because there are many reasons why people will be given nisa, right? When God will uh, push difficulties on us. There are five reasons that I count at least, and this is based on our Bernstein Shear. It goes like this. The first, and I can't remember if the first two points are discussed by Rav but at least a few of them are. It might just be to punish somebody. They did something wrong. God's going to send any sign your way, because what are you doing? So you'll get a difficulty. That's one. The second is because God wants to affect a kapara for you, that there is something we did wrong, there's a stain on our soul, and God will send any signs that we, we suffer, something that's difficult for us, and that way, we're cleansed of that sin. So when we enter Olam Haba, we'll come in clean. And that's a, that's a kindness. It's difficult. We don't appreciate it as it's happening. But it's a kindness. That's another reason. That's reason two. Reason three is because sometimes people get so comfortable with their lives. They're so, um, or potentially arrogant with the successes, they, they, the, the successes they've achieved, or the successes they think they have achieved, that God is going to shake them up. And one of the ways he, he shakes us up it's by giving us these you know, giving us difficulties. That's reason three. Reason four, sometimes people have latent potential. That is to say, a person is able to do something, but sometimes they don't always know that they could do it. They don't know. So God sends me a Nisan, and, and he'll show the, this person as they experience the Nisan, even though it's, it's uh, unenjoyable, once they pass the test, they're like, wow, I passed the test. Wow, look at that. And they'll have a new sense of, of themselves, and they'll have actualized that latent potential from within them. That's another reason why God will send us an Isaiah. And all these are meant to be meaningful. Why do bad things happen to good people? But we want to discuss the fifth reason. Sometimes God will send an Isaiah, and not as a punishment we do, do anything wrong, and not because we don't realize what we are capable of. Maybe the potential, the, the potential is in latent, it's already been actualized. However, sometimes God will send us an Isaiah to act as a banner for him to be a pole. That means to say, when you test a tzaddik, and that's, that test is on public display, it'd be a very difficult thing, people are watching. Not necessarily on purpose, not to be cruel or mean, just they see the way the tzaddik acts, and they just think, wow. And that is at least one explanation as to what God was doing when he tested Avraham. What God did was incomprehensible, and Avraham knew this. God was asking Avraham to sacrifice his son. Avraham, his whole life, he had been vouching for God, saying God is a loving God, he's a caring God, he's a merciful God, he does not approve of human sacrifice, he certainly does not approve of child sacrifice. Avram had left everything, right? Right? God sent him all his promises. He'll be a great nation. All of the promises that God made to Avram were meant to come through Yitzhak. And now God was asking Avram to sacrifice it. And look at Avram. He got up early in the morning to go do this. He would not be turned away, even with all the difficulties that were thrown at him. There are midrashim about how the Satan made this whole lake, was trying every which way to stop Avram from doing this. But Avram would not be stopped. And it was through this that God was tried, uh, sorry, that Avraham was tried, and that he was displayed as a banner for what it looks like to be an Eved Hashem, to be a servant of God. And now that is a very difficult um, lesson for us to take because it was Avraham, you know, how are, on earth are we supposed to, to live a life like that? There's a story that our friends who shares, sorry, Rabbi, Rabbi Tad shares, I do not remember the name of this rabbi, but it goes as follows. This is a true story. In the Holocaust, you can, we can only imagine the horrors that they had to uh, go through. But here's one. The Nazis were summoning 50 children to be taken, never to be seen again. And there was a family whose child was taken, but they had connections. 
and really, they actually would have been able to extract their child. They would have. But they went to the ra this rabbi, and they asked as follows. They told him, Rabbi, our child was taken by the Nazis. He's, he was one of the 50 uh, children selected, and we have the connections to take him out. The thing is, the Nazis are very particular, and they want 50 children. So if we take our child out, another child will be taken. Are we allowed to take our child out? You don't want to be the rabbi who's asked that question. So, again, this being in the middle of the Holocaust, the rabbi said, he's like, listen, I don't have my Sparta. Um, I don't have my books to be able to answer that question. I, I don't know. I can't I can't give you a psaq. I can't give you what the Allah says. So the father, I'm assuming it's the father, says to the rabbi, he's like, rabbi, the child's life is on the line. I need to know what the Allah is. Can I take him out even if another child is taken? And the rabbi said, I cannot pass him for you. I don't know. I don't have. I don't do not have my sperm. I can't give you an answer. So the father said, Rabbi, from the fact that you refuse to give me an answer, tells me that I'm not allowed to take my child out. And the father didn't take his child out. Now we hear the story, and it's simply, you know, we get chills just thinking about it. What kind of test? What a test! And if through this. We're not, we're not envying the, per the person in this position, but through this test, we see what Yer Hashem looks like, what Yer Shammai looks like, what a person's desire to cleave to Halacha, to cleave to the Torah, to cleave to God, to cleave to God's will, even when it's the most difficult of circumstances. Because that displays what, what, a, what a tzaddik, what a Torah Jew looks like, and challenges us to be better. That is at least one of the, the, uh, the, uh, the explanations for the bad things happen to good people. It's not always to punish the, the, bad, the, the good person. It is sometimes to, to allow them to serve as an example for the rest of us simple common folk. We'll leave it at there. Shabbat Shalom.